So I'm going to talk to you today about Bitcoin and blockchain, future or fad. And I thought I'd start off with an analogy um, looking back in history. And that is, I want everyone here to imagine that it's 1994, we're here together, and I come up here and I talk to you about the web. And I say, the web, future or fad. None of you have smartphones. None of you have a personal computer at home. None of you have opened a web browser. And you probably think, this guy Hadley up here talking about how the web is going to be the future is kind of a funny guy. And you're probably thinking that about Bitcoin and blockchain. But if we look back at the evolution of the web, the creation of ARPANET in 1969, the creation of TCPIP in 1982, not until 1990 did Tim Berners-Lee create the first web browser with the HTTP spec. And then there was this great article in 1994 that could have been written by Warren Buffett called The Internet Ba. And it was by a Newsweek writer basically slamming the internet. And then, of course, we had Google, Facebook, Netflix, all these sites come along. So the point here is that you really can't predict what the future is going to hold with technology innovation. And even though, as Mike pointed out this morning, things are moving faster and faster, they still sometimes take time. So now I'm going to switch to Bitcoin and hopefully give you what, after doing this many times, is my best explanation of what Bitcoin is. And I'm going to start off with a US dollar bill here. So this US dollar bill is printed in a certain way. It has a serial number on it. It's printed on special paper. And what's great about this dollar bill is when I give it to someone in the audience, say I was to hand it to this gentleman here, he would know that I no longer have this dollar bill. And he would know this is a real dollar bill, and I hadn't copied it because it's very hard to do. And he would know that I no longer have that dollar bill because it's not possible to copy money. This is called physical scarcity. And we think we live in a digital world, but actually the entire underpinning of our economy functions on physical scarcity. Money, stocks, bonds, car titles, house titles, et cetera. So hold in mind that dollar bill. Now I'm going to talk about something digital. In this case, a photo of my wonderful daughter, Dahlia. And this is a photo that I have on my phone. And say I had a network of people, say friends, and I said to someone on the network, I'm going to text this photo to you. And when I text it to you, I'm going to delete it from my iPhone. I'm not going to keep it, and I'm not going to send it to anyone else. Anyone on that network would rightfully look at me, in this case my mother, and say, you're crazy. How can you prove that that digital photo, that you didn't keep it, that you didn't copy it? And this is the underlying breakthrough of Bitcoin. Now, why do we talk a lot about Bitcoin? There's a lot of nefarious aspects to Bitcoin, things that we don't like. But we talk about it and study it at Fidelity because it is the breakthrough. Much like the music industry really didn't like Napster, it probably would have been a good idea for them to really study closely how it worked. So in this case, a digital item cannot behave like a physical item. Now let's look at Bitcoin. Bitcoin's fundamental breakthrough is solving for digital scarcity. A piece of Bitcoin is basically a digital file that is a key to a little lockbox where I can unlock that little bit of Bitcoin. When someone sends Bitcoin from someone on a network, whether that's a group of friends, a company, a series of individuals, it is a direct transfer of value. It goes from one person to the other person on the network. And unlike that digital photo, you can prove that it has not been copied. You can prove that there's only one, and you can't make copy and paste additional Bitcoin. So while the web was an incredible breakthrough in the digitization of content, mail to email, what it did not accomplish yet until Bitcoin was the internet of value, being able to transfer value digitally. That is the fundamental breakthrough of Bitcoin. What's also very interesting about it is it does it in a decentralized fashion, which is why all, everyone in this room should be very aware of this. So when you transfer Bitcoin from one person to the other, there is no Visa, there is no PayPal, there is no Fed. It just goes from one person to the other, just like an email goes over SMTP, and it's transferred. So now that I've talked a little bit about Bitcoin, I want to talk now about blockchain. And a lot of people don't like 
the B word Bitcoin, but prefer the B word blockchain. But I would suggest that you should like both. Bitcoin was the invention of so-called blockchain technology. But underneath blockchain, there are some very interesting things that we can talk about. Bitcoin is the first example, the transfer of value. But there could be many other use cases that are very interesting. So let's talk this, about this a little. First of all, what is a blockchain? So a blockchain is a triple ledger accounting system that's open. So currently, right now, our economy functions on a bunch of ledgers. I had Lee Stern work at Fidelity. I have a health plan. My health plan is with Fidelity in a database. It's with our health plan provider in another base. It's with my doctor in another database. The idea of a blockchain is it can all happen in one centralized place, and that data is immutable. So these blocks of data in a blockchain are made up of immutable, time-stamped past ledger entries. That means it is impossible to insert another entry into a blockchain. You just cannot do it. In addition, there is this notion of consensus and a distributed system. So a blockchain is not just a centralized database. It is a system of record that many other entities can use. So let's look through another use case. And I'm going to use my second child here for an example. I only have three children if you're keeping track of time for lunch. So uh, this is number two. So for number two, uh, my, uh, my eldest son just learned to drive. And in theory, but not, we're not going to, let's say we were going to buy him a new car. This is how it would look in our current way of working. The manufacturer creates the car, puts a VIN number in a database, transfers that information to a dealer with pricing, transfers to a leasing company. Everyone along that value chain has a duplicate database. And inevitably, mistakes are made. It's slow. It's cumbersome and expensive. Now let's look at that activity chain in a blockchain system. Here, all the participants are a circle around a centralized data source. Not a database, but a data source. And that manufacturer, when they create the car, puts that VIN number in this centralized ledger that anyone else on the value chain can read. And they can also write data to it. And there is this notion that you've probably heard of of smart contracts, if-then statements that are also irrefutable that can be applied business logic to a network. This, in many ways, is the promise of blockchain, this rewriting the architecture of the business value activity chain. So now I'm going to talk about the investment hypothesis. Now, if I was doing this a couple of years ago, the investment hypothesis would be talking about people on the so-called edge, um, millennials, people who are crypto anarchists who are really into this. But this has really changed. And we've seen this from our institutional clients, particularly on the family office end of things. People are becoming more sophisticated as they realize and understand and go deep that there is this new digital asset that cannot be changed. There are investment potentials. Last year, Coinbase did a billion dollar in revenue. Circle did about $2 billion every month in trades. And so we're now in an era of not just talking about the investment hypothesis, but companies are building real business models off this. So what is the investment hypothesis? I want to go back a little to what I talked about with the web. With the web, we invested in companies that built off these protocols. Now, likewise, if it was 1994 and I came to you and said, I have this incredible investment. It's called HTTP. You can buy into it, and any company that builds value off of it will impact the price of HTTP. First of all, you'd think I was crazy again, because what is HTTP? What is a protocol? But you would also not be able to do that. So instead, what we have in the internet era of investing is we try and invest in companies. Pets.com, not so good. Amazon, good. Google, good, et cetera. Well, what blockchain investing offers is the potential to flip this model. And instead of focusing on applications or companies building off applications off of protocols, you can invest in the protocol layer itself. So you can buy an Ethereum token in the hopes or thoughts or vision that there are going to be hundreds, maybe thousands of companies that are going to build new products and services off the Ethereum token 
bringing back value to that token. This is one way to look at the investing hypothesis. I will say this is a very early industry. And another thing that we are doing here at Fidelity is undertaking building an investment uh, research practice to try and value these so-called assets. It's quite complicated and quite different than valuing a traditional company. So what we've seen is a growing group led by Bitcoin, which you've probably all heard about. This chart is, is already out of date. This is quite a volatile asset class. But you see these other things that you may have heard of, Ethereum, Ripple, Dash, et cetera. And so there's this now proliferation in the space of projects and protocols which people are investing in. And this is a challenge and also an opportunity. What we are beginning to do at Fidelity is begin to segment these. There are so-called projects around digital gold and cash, Bitcoin being the leader. There are ones around interchange and settlement, Ripple being the other smart contracts and platforms, Ethereum. And then there's a whole plethora of really interesting projects that unfortunately I don't have the time to get into that really take care or really use this digital token as a utility to create shockingly new products and services that could disrupt companies like Amazon in the cloud. So future or fad, wrapping things up, I'm going to go back to my second child. He's the middle, so he had to be you know, go last. Um, and uh, he's 14, and he grows up in what we all consider an incredibly digital world. Uh, he goes to public school, and all his homework is submitted through Google Docs. He has an iPhone and a Kindle where he reads books. But all the really meaningful things about Alec, his identity, his 529, his medical records, his school grades, the diplomas, those are all on paper. The only digital thing he really has that is his own, that he owns, is some Bitcoin that he got for his birthday, he asked. 10 years from now, or even sooner, I think this will be different. Just like 10 years from now, none of us had smartphones, and now suddenly all of us do. I think we will live in a truly digital world, where not only superfluous things like Facebook updates or websites that represent ledgers exist, a world where, the, where we are truly digital and interoperable, leading to unimaginable businesses and disruptions to value chain. I'll be able to maybe buy my house with a down payment using my Google stock without settling out of anything else. There'll be interoperability between assets. So lastly, what should you do next? I would suggest that you not ignore this breakthrough technology. Um, I think we can debate, and I think it's healthy to debate, the so what around Bitcoin and blockchain. But you should not debate that core breakthrough itself around digital assets being created. I encourage you to learn. There's a lot of great reading. There's a book out there called, not a great title, Bitcoin for the Befuddled, that is a great sort of entry level into this technology. You should debate. And you should also engage with this as well.